see. We're uh, continuing uh, a two-part series in the topic of what it means to be called as a Christian. Uh, If you were here last week, uh, as we looked at Luke's gospel, uh, we talked about the fact that the basic call of a Christian is to make what? If you were here, uh, if you were here, or if you were listening, to make disciples. That's our, our most fundamental call. This morning, we look at uh, going a little deeper in what it means uh, to be called as a Christian to service in Christ, in unity with Christ. So I would invite your attention to uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, the first chapter, verses 18 through 31, and then we'll look at Luke's gospel again quickly. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation, through the foolishness of preaching, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, this one verse. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. God. Oh Lord, on this Sabbath day, help us to become your followers in every sense of the word by proclaiming your message, by being willing to serve, by being willing to endure and to be found faithful. And may the words of my mouth this day and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Foolishness. Foolishness is um, is a strong word, isn't it? It's an imp- word. It's almost bordering on impolite, as in the chastising parent that says to a child, stop that foolishness right now. Maybe it brings to mind a poor decision that you made somewhere along the way, and you say, how did I become embroiled in all this foolishness? The dictionary defines foolishness, or, or rather gives synonyms, as frivolous, dippy, I had to kind of look that one up, dippy, nonsensical, unwise behavior is foolish behavior. I think most of us like, uh, like people who think clearly and practically and pragmatically. Uh, I think most of us can follow clear logic when it's presented to us, if this, then that. And foolishness stands in contrast, I think, to logic, doesn't it? But logic has its limits. 
does. Logic can lead us to some dry and sterile places, places devoid of any sense of mystery or, or God's power even. So we have to be careful about logic. The Apostle Paul is drawing a contrast in this first chapter of Corinthians between the pragmatic wisdom of the world, good common sense, that we can all probably relate to, and the foolishness of the cross. The foolishness of the cross. He's saying foolishness, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God unto salvation. And what does this have to do with our Christian calling? Uh, last week we talked about the fundamental calling of a Christian is to make disciples. And, and this week we're talking about what it means to go even beyond that. Vocationally and, and how we just live out our Christian call in daily life. I may have told you before we used to laugh at our son when he was small because we would ask him what he wanted to do when he grew up. His answer was always the same. He said, I want to drive an ice cream truck during the day and be an NBA basketball player at night. <laughs> That'd keep him busy. The commute might even get to him. And I thought about that and I said, was that foolishness? Was that foolishness? But I'd rather term it an age-appropriate dream for a five-year-old and not so much foolishness as, as dreaming. And aspiring. I mean, wouldn't we be worried if our children, when we asked them when they were small, uh, told us instead of being, wanting to be firefighters and policemen and astronauts and gymnasts and NBA players and NFL players, what if they said, I want to grow up to be an office manager? Wouldn't you be worried? <laughs> Lab technician? We need to dream lest our spirits become dry and brittle. But the apostle is setting forth the case that what the cross stands for and what the cross means looks like so much childish dreaming and tomfoolery to those who were and are pragmatic thinkers of the world. Who in their right mind, he argues, would set aside their own self-interests in, the favor, in favor of God's purposes in the world. And Paul is saying it might just be the ultimate paradox, this Christian call. Biblical scholar Richard Hayes says of this text, for anyone who grasps the paradoxical logic of this text, the world can never look the same again. The world can never look the same again. Where do we find ourselves this morning on the continuum between the foolishness of the cross that Paul holds up and our pragmatic worldly wisdom? Are these words able to, to grab you somehow this day and to help all of us make sense of our Christian call? Because the culture would have us believe that giving up our self-interest is not a good thing. The church at Corinth was being splintered by, by divisiveness, by completing, competing claims of allegiance to the different ones who practiced different forms of baptism and different beliefs. And Paul is writing to the believers there to clarify their call and to say to them that the first, first and foremost part of your call is to proclaim the message of the cross. And all this other stuff is getting in the way of what you've been called to do. The call to, to be in ministry is a call for all of us who believe. And it's a deepening call as we go on in the course of our lives. And yet, I think the call to ministry, the, the phrase that we often use in the church, has become for us church speak at its finest. It's our interior language, and it doesn't always translate well. I always wondered what, what that meant when I was growing up and uh, one of our preachers stood up one Sunday morning in the Baptist church and said he'd been called elsewhere. 
I thought that was like being called to supper. I thought maybe he got a phone call and someone offered him another job, which is probably exactly what happened, <laughs> by the way. But the call is kind of a funny thing to talk about. And let me assure you that I had no aspirations whatsoever growing up of ever being called to ordain ministry. To my way of understanding, such a choice would have been complete and utter foolishness. And I have to believe that something else was at work. I have to believe that in a way it is indeed foolishness that I stand before you today proclaiming this gospel message. God must have the most incredible sense of humor. And I want to propose that in the life of every Christian there is a call. There is a call that is twofold. The first is that general call which we spoke of last week to become fishers of people. And then there is the particular call that we're talking about this morning. And that call is all tied up in the cross of Jesus Christ and in its power. Peter Story is a United Methodist pastor who worked very closely with Archbishop Desmond Tutu in opposition to the policies of apartheid. And Peter's story says that what can happen to us is the same thing which happened to Simon of Cyrene. And that is we are going about our business. We are doing our thing. We are living our lives. And all of a sudden the cross lays hold on you. The cross lays hold on you. You remember Simon of Cyrene? He was this minor character in the crucifixion drama. He was there with the religious pilgrims to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And in the midst of his celebrating, a cruel and bizarre parade comes through the city streets with three bloody prisoners, each one bending under the weight of their cross. The crowd is angry, using catcalls, spitting and jeering at the prisoners that are paraded by. And Simon is there and he stops. I imagine to, to witness the scene and uh, he takes it in in all of its tragedy and he wants to get I'm sure about his business and get on to his holiday and his time of rest and relaxation for which he's come to Jerusalem this nice religious holiday but it's too late one of the victims Jesus of Nazareth falls under the weight of his cross. And a Roman soldier conscripts Simon into service. You there, you, come carry this man's cross. And before he had time to even think about it, the cross of Jesus singles him out. The story says the most interesting thing about this. He says the cross of Jesus has a power all of its own and it will confront us when we least expect it or we least want it. Christ says, you've not chosen me. I've chosen you. And it's in those moments when we bear the cross and the cross lays hold on us that we are hurled into challenges that transform everything for us forever. The cross lays hold of us. Simon of Cyrene was just a normal guy when the cross laid claim on him. Now we're all called to ministry of some form or another. That's a fundamental aspect of our identity as baptized believers. We're called to follow the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our strength and our neighbor as ourself. And we're called to the great commission to go into the world teaching and baptizing and making disciples of Jesus Christ. Those things we are called to. The issue is not whether we're called. We're called to that. But what specifically are we called to do as we mature? I think it's simply to be available. 
to be available. Because there are moments of call you and I cannot plan for. We can only respond to them. And I'd say you know you are being called when the cross lays hold on you. And only you know that. And only you can discern that. And that comes through a lot of prayer, doesn't it? You and I may not be wise by human standards, but we're there in that moment, and we see the need, and we're capable of responding. We may not be as powerful as the next person, but when we're called on, we are the ones who are asked. So we go with the strength that we have, and we do the best we know to do. Maybe we have no pedigree, no lofty degrees. Maybe the only certificate we have is a birth certificate, but we'll do in a pinch when the cross lays hold on us. You see, we live in this pragmatic culture that tells us that we should avoid suffering at all costs that we need to go around it, that we need to steer clear of it, a world that says that our role is to search for fulfillment and meaning and that to enter into suffering willingly would be downright foolish, but the call of the Christian gospel says exactly the opposite and it is foolishness to the world. I don't know that we have to think of ourselves as holy. I know I'm not holy. I'm going on to perfection and I've got a long way to go. I'm no saint. Maybe you're not either. Maybe we're just normal people trying to do the best we can and believing that the power is not in us, that the life is not in you or in me. Thank goodness, but it is in the one who is the source of our life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We can't know when the cross is going to lay hold on us, but we can be ready and we can be open and we can be available and hopefully we won't flinch when it happens. Hopefully we'll shoulder it and we'll find that under its weight we find the meaning we've been looking for. We find our life's work. We find our true calling. And the cross, oh the cross always takes us in places we'd rather not go, doesn't it? It takes us into nursing homes that sometimes don't smell that good. It takes us into hospitals beside the bedside of those who are dying. It takes us into jail cells. It brings us into relationship with each other in the church in the midst sometimes of brokenness and conflict. It takes us into the slums of Haiti. It takes us even on Wednesday evenings sitting side by side with the homeless who have wandered in. The cross takes us there. Seventeen years ago, I was a lot like Simon of Cyrene. I was interested in what was going on. I was on a religious holiday and the cross laid hold on me and I felt a call to parish ministries and, and, and some of my good friends took me aside and said, you know something, you've lost your mind. You are foolish. And from a pragmatic standpoint, they were absolutely right. And so what I do is I foolishly try to do my best, but sometimes I stumble and I falter as, as I pick up that cross. And I think we all honestly do because learning to carry the cross of Jesus is not a neat and sanitary thing. It doesn't happen without some degree of our own natural clumsiness being involved. But again, Thanks be to God, the power is not in me, it is in the cross. And you and I, if we are true to our callings, must carry that cross that lays hold on us. Because it's in that unexpected, unanticipated moment that we'll truly live out our calling. And we'll make ourselves available to the deeper meaning of our lives. We won't be 
wringing our hands saying, what shall I do with my life? What shall I do with my life? When the cross lays hold on us, we become one with Christ. We become united in his suffering and his shame. And the world doesn't look the same to us ever again. And it will look to all the world to be pure and utter foolishness that we are engaged in. But to those of us who are being saved, it is nothing less than the power of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us to to know how the cross is seeking to lay hold on us this day. Calling us not to ease and comfort, but to a share in your suffering. Calling us to become as broken bread and poured out wine. Presenting our bodies as, as living sacrifice. No longer boasting in ourselves, but in you. As we come this morning to receive the broken bread and the cup, may we leave letting the cross fully lay hold upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to live as Jesus lived. receive you will be led by the ushers to come and receive any offering you leave at the communion rail will go to our monthly mission focus operation hope Hear the call and to follow. Amen. made that 
that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So he shared in his bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace. Around the table of the King. Now, beloved, arise to go and live out your calling for Jesus Christ. Amen. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, torn for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life. Paid the price to make us one. So we share in this bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love. Around the table of the King. Now, beloved, arise to go and live out your calling in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember he drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So Around the 
And now, beloved, arise to go and live out your calling for Jesus Christ. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The invitation is to let the cross lay hold on you. 
And so as we stand to sing this final hymn, Be Thou My Vision, if you would like to avail yourself of this altar rail once again, or you would simply like to hear others sing these words and meditate on their meaning, if you'd like to let them speak deeply to you and be your call to service in whatever way you would respond. If you're here this day and you would unite with this congregation, we want you to know you'd be received with open arms. Let us stand.